Good morning and welcome here to Prairie Alliance Church. We are so glad to have you with us here this morning, whether you are here in Portage or in person in Nipua or in Dauphin or and now Dryden, welcome here and everybody online. It is just so good to be together as a community celebrating and worshiping God. Um, just a reminder, if you are sitting in here, um, make sure if you're not sitting with your family that you have three seats in between each of you. Uh, my name is Teresa Stanley, and I'm the youth pastor here at the Portage Campus, and we're getting pretty excited about the youth program that's going to be starting here soon, so check your Instagram, check your Facebook, all of our regular places that we post our youth stuff, and you will find out information there. We have a baptism class starting here on October 20th. If you haven't signed up, it's not too late. You can do that whether you phone the office or go to office uh, email office at mypac.tv. There is also a soul care portion of that. If you don't have the book, you need to get the book and start reading it. And also, if you're on one of our other campuses in Nipua or Dauphin, if you can't come to Portage for it, talk to your uh, campus pastor. Dauphin is Kevin, and Nipua is Rylan and Sonia, and they will make sure to get you connected with that. Our kids' ministry segment, which I know um, I always like to see what Pastor Tamara and her littles are up to, you can head to mypack.tv slash kids, and you can watch their um, little clip there and see what shenanigans and lessons they have for us there. <clears throat> Our offering, if you, a lot of you are already giving online, which is great. If you're wondering how to give, just go to mypack.tv slash give this time, and it will walk you through how to give online. Also, if you're in-house here or in Nipua, our debit machines are open for that as well. Uh, we are just so thankful for your continued generosity and giving in this way. Uh, we get to do lots of really cool things, which if you have been here for any length of time or have been listening online, um, our house churches have been given this cool gift uh, for the Thanksgiving potluck uh, that we're going to do a little differently. And they get to take some money and go and see what they can do with it, multiply it and bless families and bless people. And so lots of cool ideas pouring in. Uh, but if you are doing that in your house church, please send photos or videos to the church office by October 9th, I think it is, so that we can make sure we have them up and running for the Thanksgiving potluck, which Nathan has a message about here. We'll listen to it. Hey everybody, I'm excited to give you this message just a few weeks out from our annual Thanksgiving potluck. For as long as I can remember, and that's not an exaggeration, for as long as I can remember, the Thanksgiving potluck has been a huge part of Prairie Alliance Church. When I was in my teens, I would come in with my tithe, ready to contribute to this massive offering so that we could prepare the church for what God has for it. And now as an adult, myself and you as well as a congregation, we just come together on this night in unprecedented ways, especially the last few years as we've seen our total increase year by year by year until last year, the combined offering for that day was about $140,000. And here we are talking about Thunder Bay, talking about Dauphin, talking about Dryden and being poised for what God has next for us. I bring up the offering because it's kind of been lost a little bit in this exciting process about the 250 bucks that we gave to the house churches. Because we're getting excited about how we're blessing our communities and as early ideas are coming in and we're hearing them as staff, it's, it's cool to see how everybody's engaging. And yes, on that potluck night, we will be sharing those stories. Chris and I will like be having a virtual potluck with you. Hopefully you'll meet with your house church on that night, October 18th at 6.30 p.m. and you can tune in and hear some of these stories and testimonies about how house churches have used that money. There's also a good chance that there's a Dryden contingent going to be out here that week. So that's kind of a cool piece of the puzzle as well. So tune in October 18th, 6.30 p.m. for the stories. And later that night, you'll actually get a total for the offering. One of the cool things on October 18th is that we'll try to do like we do at every Thanksgiving potluck or banquet where there's a group of people that sort of hang around afterwards and wait until the tally comes in. And then through the rest of the evening, my phone's going off, people asking, and they're saying, how did we do? Because they're excited about what kind of generosity we get to celebrate. And so I want to be able to give our church that total that night. If you want to give that night, you can use our online giving portal on our website, www.mypac.tv give. 
I think that's right. If that's wrong, it'll appear in the right text underneath me magically, but I trust that's right. If not, just go to our website and give there. But because not everybody will be able to be a part of that night, we're going to take all the money that's given from October 12th to 18th and count it towards that total that we celebrate. So if you're away from a computer that week or if you're out of town, you can still pop by the church from the 12th to the 18th drop off your contribution then, or you can give online. And everything that comes in that week, unless it's specifically designated otherwise, will be included in that total. So it's gonna be the culmination of a lot of exciting things. We're gonna have probably some guests coming from out of town, from Dryden. We're gonna talk more about vision. We're gonna hear about all the micro level transformative stuff in our towns that our house churches are doing in Dauphin and Nipah and Portage. And Chris and I are gonna have a blast sort of being invited into your various living rooms as house churches celebrate. So make sure that's on your radar. Thanks for being a part of this. You have been such a critical part of it for year upon year upon year. God has been so faithful to us through COVID as a church that I don't think it's naive for us to anticipate that October 18th, we might yet again have an unprecedented outpouring of generosity as we move forward into what God has us for. Thanks everybody, and we'll see you then. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I know our house church is getting pretty excited about this. Uh, well, I think actually we're just getting really excited about being able to eat together. It's going to be pretty great. Um, but yeah, definitely put that on your calendar and uh, be ready to celebrate that together. Uh, we are, it is our down week, and so um, I'm going to ask you to stand as we pray our down prayer together. And just a reminder, if you're going to sing during the worship, please make sure that you have your mask on as well. So Heavenly Father where we have failed to notice the needs of others, we ask your forgiveness. Where we have treated things as more important than people, we ask you to change our hearts. Where we have been selfish with our time, we confess our sin. And now, by your Holy Spirit, would you give us your heart for the hungry, the poor, and the suffering. And we ask in the name of the one who gave everything for us, Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Turn it over to you, Regan. Have a great morning.
mercy, you're my help in time for me. Lord, I can't help but see. different. My plans have changed. The future doesn't look the way I imagined it. What can this mean? I keep staring, hoping to understand. My world is upside down. Everything I believed, my entire purpose, has been changed. I just want things to be the way they were. We can't go back. We're in this for good. But there's hope on the horizon. There's goodness in the midst of my confusion. I'm scared, but this new normal has brought me new joy, unexpected blessing, and a greater sense of purpose. So I step into what's next because what's next is good. 
So I step out into a new normal. Hello. Hello. You guys sound great. Uh, great to see people joining online, and it's great to see you all here. And uh, thanks, thanks for coming, whatever shape or form, this morning to be here. We've been going through this series of acts. My name is Chris, and uh, we're going to dive into uh, kind of where we left off a little bit last week and, uh, and go a little bit further this week. I don't know if you know this, but I have moved, a great move, a great move from um, the city of Portage all the way to the RM of Portage. Are there any people from RM in the room? Is, where are my peeps at? I got a couple peeps. It's good. It's good. I'm now resonating with the RMers of Portage in my great move. And uh, it's been a great move for me and my, and my family. We moved in with our in-laws as well. And because uh, they're in the room, this is going amazing. We're having an amazing time. We're doing so good, eh? We're just, we are having a good time together. And, uh, and we're, the cool thing is we've, we've moved, it's been a big change. There's, we've moved right into, right onto the river. So we are in like, nature is like, it's there. Like, I, I am seeing things I've never seen before. And I think discovering things that I've never <laughs> discovered before. I, I realize that I am in fact a city boy and I don't know a whole lot about that. Grew up in the city and, and kind of my whole life, so I'm, I'm getting educated. I realized I, I didn't know a whole lot about nature um, when, I, when I met Corey and Sally Wilms, good friends of ours. And so they loved to, they took us for a lot of nature hikes, a lot of walks. And during that time, uh, I definitely got educated about nature. I definitely um, felt a little inadequate. They definitely knew a lot more, especially Corey. So my first walk out, and we are looking at scat. We, we are discovering scat and what scat is and, and, and what this type of scat. And that, it, it took me about an hour to I realized and we're talking about poo. Oh, it's poo. Oh, we're why don't we just say poo? Why are we calling it scat? Okay, so I'm getting educated. That's called scat, Chris. It's not called poo. And look, this is from this type of animal. So I'm getting educated. And we've had a lot of these trips together. It's been a lot of fun, but over the course of the time, um, I'm getting more educated than I am actually contributing. And so at some point, I developed this persona to kind of enter into the nature walk experience. And it's, it's, he's referred to as Nature Chris. Nature Chris comes out, and Nature Chris likes to educate people about things that he thinks about nature. He, he has his own ideas. He has his own, um, well, yeah, his own spins on things. I don't know if you guys ever heard of jingleberries. I like to warn people, follow me as I lead the nature hikes. Watch out for these jingleberries over here. They look just like Saskatoon's. Not quite the same thing. Look out, don't, don't eat those. So I give people some advice I, I, as well. Oh, careful over here. We have some deer mold, everyone. You want to walk away from the deer. You can waft the deer mold, but don't take a deep breath. That's really bad. Definitely, definitely do not touch the deer mold because if you do, you could become impregnated by a deer and that it gets really complicated. So these are, these are some glimpses, true, 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 exactly of kind of how I, I, I do this. And it's to compensate with the fact that I don't know a whole lot about nature. And so we just have a lot of fun. But now I'm in this new place. My whole environment has changed. There's nature everywhere. And this environment is actually changing me inside to actually become curious more about nature. So I walked out the other day, and my whole backyard's moving like this. And I'm like, what is going on? I look, and it's all these ducks. And the ducks are gobbling down acorns. Now, that sounds like something nature Chris would say. <laughs> no, they, they, no, these were ducks. These are ducks, Ray. <laughs> Don't get into my story. Ducks, they are gobbling down acorns, and I'm like, they're going to die. I, like, I'm, I'm propelled to like, run out onto the lawn and be like, no ducks, don't eat the acorns, those are for squirrels. So I have to do a little research. It turns out, of course, ducks don't have teeth. I knew that much, but they have a gizzard, crushes the acorns, it goes into their bellies. Like, I don't know if that educated you. I was getting totally educated by this, and it's true. It's true. So anyway, so this, it, because my external environment has changed, it started to change things inside of me, get me more curious about, about nature. And um, as we go into the book of Acts, you're going to see kind of that impact the disciples have. As, as they go into the environment, they can change things in the environment that starts to get people inside uh, a little bit curious about what's going on here. But also in the book of Acts, as we talk about Pentecost today, the coming of the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit comes inside them, it starts to change things outside of them as well. So we're going to dive into... Uh, some things about Pentecost, and maybe you can let Nature Chris walk you along and maybe give you some clues and some symbols about the text that might speak to us a little bit more in a deeper way, and we can learn more about God and ourselves in it. 
a couple questions I was asking is when I saw the Holy Spirit coming in this way was like, had to do with why is he coming exactly then? Why did he, you know, Jesus have to make them wait? And then why is he coming in that way, a very strange way, right? Fire, we're speaking languages, there's, there's stuff we're going to look at. Could those things there be of significance to us? Maybe there's things we don't know because we're not familiar with the surroundings. And maybe today we can look at what those things might have meant for them. So we're going to start off by reading um, just kind of a pickup from where we were. And uh, this is Acts 1 verse 3. Acts 1 verse 3, Jesus basically died. He resurrected. He's now back and he is talking to them and he's teaching to them. And so he says, to, to, to these he also presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs. By the way, that would have been really cool. He's like, look, I'm not dead. Look at me. I'm alive. Look what I can do. So I have lots of questions about that. Anyways. So he, he appears to the disciples, and, and over a period of 40 days, he's been speaking to them of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So that's the context that he's been teaching them about the kingdom of God. So now Acts 2, verse 1, he tells them to wait for 10 days. And then when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. So Pentecost occurs 10 days after Jesus ascends. So he teaches them for 40 days. He ascends. 10 days later, there's this Pentecost. They're all together. This is this moment. So what's going on there? Is there something about the timing of that that might mean more to the disciples than maybe we understand? So let's continue. We're going to see some symbols here that on the surface, maybe we don't know what they are for, but they are very strange uh, when they come upon the disciples. So here's what takes place in Acts 2, verse 4. Or sorry, verse, Acts 2, verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire. So there's this fire comes, it kind of distributes itself. It looks a little bit like tongues, and it rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So here, very strange things are happening. There is fire. There is a sound that is, is, is big. And then there is this language that starts to happen. What is that about? Does that remind you of anything maybe in the Bible where you've seen that before? Any clues? The language thing for me, I'm like, okay, maybe the Tower of Babel. We saw that when all, all the people were together speaking one language. God comes and he separates them. They all get different languages. And now God's bringing people back. And there's a beautiful, I think, piece of that if you look back at that story in the Old Testament. But there's something else. And it has to do with fire and language and wind and sound and thunder. And uh, if you have any clues to you, it might be pulling out of things out of Exodus. When the... Israelites were moving out of ex, out of being um, basically moving from deliverance from being delivered from Pharaoh, and now they arrive at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, these same symbols are happening. So let's read about that. This is now going back to Israel's history. They just got free from Pharaoh. They've been in the wilderness. They now arrive at Mount Sinai to get the law from God, and says this is what happened. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder. Remember that word and lightning, flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke God answered with thunder. Some of your translations, in, in, Moses spoke and then God spoke. Or Moses spoke and God answered in a language. That word for thunder is very interesting. It's this Hebrew word. It is the word kolot. Kolot means thunder, but it also means voices, and it also means languages. It's all the same word. There's this Jewish tradition that when God gave the laws to his people on how they were to live, that God spoke in all the languages of the world. So they could understand how to live. Do you remember this story? Jesus is getting baptized. Uh, skies, there's a voice from heaven, and it speaks. 
And it says to him, it says, you are my beloved son. And some said it sounded like thunder. And some said it sounded like the voices of angels. Voices. Thunder. Language. What's going on? For the disciples of what's occurring, these signs and symbols are pointing them into their history, into their culture, and it's pulling on their DNA. It's pulling on God being with them through their culture. And now they're realizing that the same things that are happening at Mount Sinai, where they're about to receive the new laws of God, are happening right here and now. These same things. This word for Pentecost, this is a Greek word, it means 50 days. But it actually comes from the Hebrew word Shavuot. Shavuot is, means weeks, and it's the celebration of the weeks, the seven weeks, the seven Sabbaths actually, from the time that Israel got delivered from Pharaoh at Passover all the way time till they get to Mount Sinai where God gives them this new law. Seven weeks, seven times seven, that's 49 plus one because they're not going to celebrate on the Sabbath, they celebrate on Shavuot the day after. So there's this same thing, Pentecost, Shavuot, and today Jews celebrate Shavuot, the day that God gave us the law. For the disciples then, the Spirit is coming on exactly that 50th day, the Shavuot day. God's going to do something new. Through their traditions, he's revealing that something significant is about to happen right now. In some of the ways that they practice Shavuot, uh, there's a few things that we can explain about uh, the preparation during these weeks of what they would do traditionally, and then also the celebration itself. If we go back to Israel's history as they get freed from Pharaoh, this God who's been ruling over them, he sees himself as a God. In this time in the wilderness, God is needing to prepare them to receive something new, to get them out of the old teachings and identity of what Pharaoh has said they are. They're slaves, and God is trying to get them into an identity that they're his children, they're his chosen people. How's he going to do that? How's he going to prepare them for that? 420 years of slavery. He does it through bread. He does it through bread. You guys know the story about manna. God starts to give them bread because they run out of food in this journey of 50 days. They run out, and God starts to provide for them this bread, but this bread carries three laws with it. And these laws, though, are kind of like laws on training wheels. No matter how hard you try to break them, they're still fulfilled. <laughs> so some of the ways that this worked for them is that they were to collect, one of the laws was they were to collect an omer's worth of food each day. This bread would fall, they would collect, and the omer is about three and a half liters of food for the day. If you think about a big milk jug, almost that much. That's how much they were to collect. So they were to collect this bread, this amount of bread, and have it for themselves and their family. Like they would all each collect that much. If you tried to collect more than what you were supposed to, by the time you got home, you had exactly an omer's worth. If you tried to take less by the time you got home, you had exactly almost worth. If you tried to store up the manna, it would rot. No matter what you tried to do, you would always end up with exactly what you needed for that day. Give us this day our daily bread, our manna. It's this process of he started to undo the things of Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, as you're my people, you're my slaves, I want you to collect bricks and straw. But God is start to undo it. Instead of bricks and straw, you're going to collect bread. And he put the quotas really high, impossible to make. That They would just die trying to make these quotas. And instead of quotas, God gives them a perfect allotment of how to live. He provides that for them every day. Instead of doubling their workload like Pharaoh, God is undoing it by doubling the amount of bread they get for the Sabbath. And instead of working hard or doubling their workload, he, he gives them rest. It's in this... 50 days in their history, in their past, that God is undoing the teachings, the leaven, the, the teachings of Pharaoh, and he instead is preparing them to enter into a new thing that he wants to do with them, to give them the laws that are going to show them how to live as God's chosen people, to provide freedom in the world, to, to live, create a world that, that doesn't put people in, in bondage. So on this 50th day at Pentecost, these disciples are, I believe, sometimes we think they're waiting and they're kind of clueless. And maybe that might be the case, but I think in some way, I think 
you know, Jesus had taught us for 40 days. There's 10 more days left before Shavuot. Maybe something amazing is going to happen on Shavuot, guys. Maybe God's going to do something new for us. So, in this, one of the things in this ceremony of Shavuot that they had been practicing is the ceremony of the two loaves. Two loaves are quite interesting. They're to represent the double portion of manna that God gave them, but it also they're to create loaves with the new harvest. This whole celebration of the week is around the new harvest, the spring harvest of the wheat. And they take all of that and they make new bread with fresh leaven. In Passover, we take out the leaven of the bread. You might have remembered in some of Jesus' teaching that leaven is teaching. But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. At Passover, we take out the leaven of Pharaoh to now embrace the new level, level leaven, the new teaching of God. So what the disciples may have been practicing at this time is the two loaves of, of actually during this time of waiting that Jesus is actually undoing the laws in the ways that they grew up understanding from the Pharisees and he's actually preparing them to receive something new. Not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law to live inside them and guide them and strengthen them to live this transformed life. Forty days of teaching for new leaven. And there's this deep cultural connection I think is happening for the disciples when this spirit comes upon them. There's fire, there's language, there's wind, there's this sound, it's thunder, and they're realizing that God is doing this new thing in us right now, not on a mountain, but in us. It's like a mother tongue moment where something deeply in your culture connects with you. Wow, God is using my culture. He's speaking to me in my culture. He's speaking my language. When the Spirit comes, I see him coming in three ways in this next little section. You're going to see maybe that um, when the Spirit comes, he, he obviously unites us, but, and he uses that language and culture. But beyond that, there's three things. He, he'll take something really practical, and he, he's going to make it supernatural. And then the second thing he's going to do, he's going to take something supernatural, and he's going to make it really practical. And then he's going to do something practically and supernaturally at the same time, and it's going to be amazing. Let's have a look at some of this. Acts, continuing in 2, verse 4, they're filled with the Spirit. They began to speak in tongues, and as the Spirit was giving them utterance, they have this ability now. And now they were other Jews living in Jerusalem, devout man from every nation under heaven. So basically this festival of Shavuot is a pilgrimage. All the Jews from all over are now coming back to Jerusalem. And when this sound, that word sound can be voices, languages, when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered. They hear this sound and they start coming because each of them was hearing these disciples speak in their own language. Someone is speaking my language to me. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all these, Gal- Gal- are there, are these guys not Galileans? Like, how are they speaking my language? And how is it that each of us, we hear them in our own language to which we were born? When the Spirit comes, it does something very practical, but it brings an understanding for these people that is supernatural. The disciples have been with Jesus for 40 days. They're receiving an undoing and maybe even some new teaching. Behold, a new command I give you. They start to communicate this to other people. It's being translated through the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's coming not in like a, a crazy way. It's coming in a, in, a, in a practical way that it's a language they know. It's not foreign to them. They can understand it. It's like in this moment something clicked for the first time. It reminded me of, of, of uh, my, my in-laws, John and Charity, um, who are missionaries in Africa. But before going there, they were planting churches in Manitoba. They were learning how to plant churches here. They moved into a small community in Richard, Manitoba, and kind of got to meet some people. And, and in that process, uh, some people came to Jesus. One lady in particular named Anka, uh, a lady from Germany, came to Jesus. And um, they had this, Charity and her had this great relationship. And it's about two years in, and Charity comes over for tea at Anka's house. And, and this time, Charity brings her grandma with her. And Anka is there with her grandma. And somewhere in this tea conversation, 
Charity's grandmother starts to speak to Anka's grandmother. Hi, German. And they, she starts to share with her about Jesus. And talking about it and sharing deeply. And suddenly, though, Anka, who's already been a Christian for two years, suddenly has this click where I've been a Christian, I love Jesus, but it's like now he's sunk into the roots of my life. He not only loves me, he loves my culture. He loves me. And she said, I now believe that this God is for me. I now believe this is a God who identifies with me. When the Holy Spirit comes, he reveals the importance of identifying with people. He connects with them in a really practical way. I get a kick out of this. There's people that uh, I see do this do really well. One of them is Teresa Stanley, who is up here giving the announcements. Awesome lady. I get to go with her to Mexico. And she has been, you know, when we go to Mexico, she takes time. She's been studying the language. She studies Spanish, and she's way better than I do. I go to Mexico. I talk to people. They scratch their heads. But I look over at Teresa's corner over here, and there's, like, laughing and crying and hugging. It's amazing. Like, the Spirit's moving over here. Me, uh, I don't know what's going on, but over here, something amazing is happening. This practical thing is doing something supernatural to connect these people of different cultures. It's really, really neat to see. Recently, West Park has just started to work with some of the Dakota elders to try to think about ways to make our school more inviting, more welcoming for people who come to school here at West Park off of reserve. And what can we do? And, and we're listening to the elders. And a few years ago, I got to sit with one of these elders, and he explained about their culture and all these traditions. And I just saw Jesus all over their stories. I saw the Creator all over their traditions. I was amazed. I was like, are you preaching the Bible to me right now? Like, what is happening? It was unreal. If you want to have eyes to see God in culture, if you choose to have eyes to see that God is using culture, you will see him there every time. But it's a choice you get to make. Here's some things. Think about this. Sacrifices. Is that a Christian thing or a pagan thing? It's a pagan thing first. What about mountaintop experiences? Going up to the mountaintop, Moses, Abraham, guys, you go to the mountaintop to find God. Is that a Christian thing or a pagan thing? It was a pagan thing first. You go to the mountaintops to find God. Uh, what about um, casting lots? You, throw, you roll the dice. You don't know what to do. You roll the dice. This is, is that a pagan thing or is it a Christian thing? It's a pagan thing, but God used it. What about um, idols in Greece? Is that a pagan thing or a Christian thing? Oh, Paul, God uses it with Paul. See, there's, there's, there's things in culture, and if you have a pagan mentality to it, you won't see God already at work. Amazing thing when my in-laws arrived on the scene in Africa, as they learned more about the culture, that God was already there. And they got to connect more and more about that in their time there. Oh, yeah, Supernatural stories. So God is speaking the language. Uh, they're, they're, they're actually hearing this language. They're, it's, it's somehow the disciples are speaking it, but the neat thing is it says that they're actually hearing it. They're hearing it in their mother tongue. Something deeply is connecting with these people around them. And we might think, actually, I'll, yeah, we'll, we might think that that God is, is kind of like, how does that actually work? I'll give a couple, a couple examples here. We'll go through this next. I will go to verse 9. So there's all these different types of people now there, these Jews. And uh, we have Parinthians. You might want to count these. Medes, Elamites, El 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 residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, uh, Egypt, in the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and the visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Uh, 
I don't know if you did the math there, but I, was, I counted um, at least, there's at least 15 different uh, tribes and languages there. How many disciples were there? Twelve. So what's happening? Is Peter more anointed? Is he speaking, hey, I'm going to take these three people group over here. I'm, I'm speaking three languages right now. I'm going to talk to these guys. You guys all go to your one to get 15. How's that working? No, you're going to see Peter later. It's just one person speaking to all of them, and they have this comprehension moment. It doesn't matter who would walk in front of this person. God, whatever they would say, God would speak it to them in their mother tongue. That's how they would hear it. And I've had a couple of neat stories of this actually happening in my life. It's, it's crazy. I've probably shared these already with you, but they're just too good. A few years ago, I went to Portage Place, and I saw this beautiful uh, grandmother in a wheelchair. And my heart just was like, went out for her. She was this First Nations lady, and I just went over just to kind of maybe I could encourage her. Maybe I could buy her, like, supper. Like, I just, I just wanted to go and talk with her. I started talking with her and just saying, and my friend's there with us, and we're just kind of saying hi and greeting. And I quickly get a, her grandson's with her, and he just says, hey, she doesn't speak English. It's like, okay, yeah, no problem. So anyways, I keep talking with this lady, and we're having this conversation, and we're both, I'm here in English, like we're talking. And she's, so basically, she's telling us the story, that she's there from the north, and she's there for the Health Science Center. She just had a stroke. She can't move her arm. It's totally paralysis. And we're like, hey, we should pray for that. And then just interrupted again, hey, buddy. She doesn't speak English. Okay, at this point, I think this guy's tipped a few back. I'm not too sure. Like, I'm, like I, I, what, I don't know what's up with him, but I just I'm like, keep talking to her. I'm like, okay, we're going to pray for your arm. And we pray. Cool thing. And she starts to move her paralyzed arm. And she's excited. She's, she's healed in that moment. And, and we're just having this awesome connection. And we got to share all these stories, and then we, we leave. And then... Uh, three months later, my friend goes back to Portage Place, and he sees this lady in the wheelchair. And he's like, hey, and she's like, hey, waving her, look at, oh, yeah, the arm, yeah, look at me. You know, she's using it. And then he tries to have this conversation with her, and he can't. And she's speaking Cree, and he's speaking English, and they're like, go to this person who's just like, could you translate for us? And they start to reconnect. You know, in that moment, I don't know why, but God just decided to move the barrier for us to communicate, to connect on a deeper level. It's really cool. Another, another time I was in Mexico and I went with Dave Stanley, Teresa's husband. You guys know Dave? Dave leads a team up in Mexico. And we were doing church one day and uh, we were at the church. And it was an awesome service. It's the same church that uh, Sahid, who is, uh, runs the, orphan, the children's home, we're at his church, awesome service, we go eat. Like, you, there's church, and then you just move over, and you eat right there. And, and it's tamale time. We're having tamales, so this is going to be good. And so I'm over by the food. I look at the back, and Dave is over there with one older lady, and they're having a conversation. I'm like, oh, this will be good. <laughs> I don't know if you, I, I know something. Dave, Dave is the worst at Spanish. Like, I'm bad. Sorry, Dave. I'm bad, but he takes it to another level. Like, we just, we just get louder, more actions, right? We talk louder when, we're not, when someone's not understanding, more action. Move the bricks here. Like, like you move them here. Like, that's going to, oh, now I get it. Thanks for explaining that. Sometimes Dave throws a little bit of French in there. Instead of just like, like instead of saying, like, um, like in, you know, like, why in Spanish, por qué? He says, por qua. You know, like, so this is, this is some legit... This is legit how we do this sometimes. So I, I, I'm looking at Dave. I'm looking at this lady. And they're having this conversation. I'm like, oh, this will be good. This is going to be funny. How is this going to work? I see Sahid. He's looking. Sahid is looking at, at this lady that he knows. And he's, he's looking at Dave. I'm looking at Dave. But we're eating our tamales, whatever. Afterwards, Sahid goes up to Dave. He says, Dave, Espanol? Like, do you speak Spanish? Dave's like, no, no, no. We're talking in English. Anglais? No, Dave, no. <laughs> Doing my best to heat impersonation if you know him. <laughs> no, Dave. No, Dave. No, Anglais. No, no. We had this conversation. She was telling me about her tamales and what she puts in her tamales. Like, the recipe is really good. Telling me all about her family. And we just had this, Dave, she cannot speak English. And what? And this moment, I know Dave... Uh, in that moment, just culturally, just like, what is God doing? Now, that lady did not need to hear about Jesus. She was a Christian. She was a believer. But God chose to translate things about her culture. 
Things about our heritage. Things about our family. That matters to God. Supernatural, but really practical, not weird. Really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. God's amazing. Third thing. Third thing the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes it's not just natural. Sometimes it's not just supernatural. He likes to take practical things, and he likes to take supernatural things, and he combines them. And let's read about this. This is something the disciples were doing. Actually, there's not a verse for this, but here's this, uh, the, these days of Shavuot. In the days of Shavuot, 40 days Jesus teaches them. They have these 10 days, and what are you going to do in the waiting? Well, we're, it's the festival of weeks. So the disciples, I believe, Nathan talked a bit about this, they just knew what they were supposed to be doing anyways. They, they, they just were practicing, preparing their hearts for this new, this new marriage ceremony of receiving the law or whatever Jesus wanted to do in this moment. They're prepared. They're just doing what they know they're supposed to do. They're practicing their traditions in this 10-day period. But then on the 50th day, something supernatural happens and all these things take place. They're, but there's something that, like, they're connected. The practical and the supernatural, God uses them both. It's not one or the other. This happened the other day, Thursday. This lady calls the church and uh, it's this mom in Portage, about four kids. And she's like, this is really scary for me. I, I, I never ask for help, but I've lost my job because of COVID. I have this terrible abscess tooth. I have incredible pain and swelling, and I just need some money so I can go and get my tooth pulled. I, I don't have it. I said, okay, um, I'll see what I can do. You guys are so generous in your giving that you give to things like Compassion Portage or Compassion Dauphin or, or Compassion Nipawa, that we're able to, in moments like this, when somebody's just in a bad place, we can actually maybe do something about that. So I said, okay, and, and what I had at the time is I had some gift cards that I could give her. I said, if I give you all these gift cards for that amount of the dentist bill, could you use your money that you were going to have for groceries, could you use that to, to go to the dentist? She said, that would be amazing. And we just had this long pause. She was just overwhelmed by the generosity. I said, hey, before you go, I'm going to get that arranged, but before you go, could I pray for your tooth? Yeah, sure. So... 30-second prayer, you know, pray for her. Okay, so I'll call you right back. I'm going to check on those uh, grocery cards, and uh, I'll let you know when you can pick those up. So I go, I talk to Gail. She gets me the cards, and uh, I call her back. Probably 15 minutes later, I said, hey, how are you doing? Okay, I got those cards. She said, hey, something weird happened when I hung up the phone. I said, oh, I like weird. <laughs> <laughs> So I hung up the phone, and suddenly in my mouth, this, something popped. And all of that pain and pressure was released. And my, I feel so much better. Now, <laughs> something so practical of you being generous to be able to answer a need with these gift cards. And yet something supernatural combined to meet her in this place. The text I got back later that she said to me, Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you. Her mother tongue. Just beautiful. So when the spirit comes, he comes in power. There's this last verse, Acts 2.13. Acts so they're doing this crazy thing. Other people are not fully understanding what they're seeing. And they start mocking the disciples, saying, they're full of this sweet wine or this new wine. At this festival they're having, they're celebrating this ceremony of the two loaves, the new harvest. But also they're celebrating this new wine. So you harvest the grapes and you make new wine. And so that's what they think is going on because there's a big party going on. They're just drunk. We don't know what's going on here. It's interesting that Jesus talks about wine and he says, you know, um, wineskins. He talks about getting, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. They have to go into new wineskins. Do not be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's this comparison to wine and the Spirit and, and removing the old so you can receive something new. In this ceremony, I believe that, that they're understanding there's this wine connection about the Spirit, about what God's doing. Holy Spirit comes to them, it fills them, and it's not, it's, it's like they've received teachings from Jesus before, right? They've been taught for, for so what's the difference going to be? 
that Jesus is teaching for 40 days, what's the clincher difference going to be? It's because this Jesus who actually lived all of these laws perfectly, every temptation he defeated, everything that challenged him he overcame, he won. That spirit, that same spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead has now come to live in them, to write it on their hearts and into their minds, deep into their DNA. That's the spirit of power that's coming to fill them. It's this victory spirit. The victory that Jesus overcame these things and did them perfectly, he fulfills them, and then he fulfills them in us by giving us the power to do it in our lives. I was at a a place in Chicago at uh, basically a teaching. It was a Bible class type of a thing. Very interactive class back and forth. And we know the fruits of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we know it's patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. One person in the audience was like, okay, but practically, like, how do, you, how do you overcome lust? How do you overcome sin? Like, temptation, addiction, like, you know, he's just going through some of the issues of his life. He wants to know, like, how do you get past this stuff as a Christian? And this facilitator just helped him. He's like, so, you know, where's, you know, do you have, where's Jesus? Okay, he's inside you. It's that same spirit. Where is he right now? He lives in you. He lives in you. And, and so the spirit that gives life, the spirit that gives grace, the spirit that gives self-control, he lives in you. And he kind of just gathered the class and he said, so do you want to know the secret of how to stop sinning? And we're all, everyone's like on the edge of their seats, like, how do you do that? And he looks at this guy and he just says, stop it. Because Jesus did it, you can too. It's not the old spirit of you trying to do it on your own. Because the power of Jesus is in you, you can. That's not a solo mission to try to do it on your own. You're not outside of the body. You are part of the body. You're not a single member. So when we have things like addictions or problems in our life, we actually can lean on the power of the body. But we can actually overcome those things because there is a new spirit in you. There is a new wine flowing through you. It's Jesus. A couple things... <laughs> To make this practical for us as we go into Thanksgiving and maybe connecting some of these ideas about Shavuot. This time in the wilderness, uh, or this time as the, the Israelites were in the wilderness, they were learning how to undo the leaven of Pharaoh to receive the new leaven of the Spirit, new leaven of God, the new laws of God. So maybe three pieces. There's something practical, there's something supernatural that you can do, and then there's also both that you can do at the same time. Okay, so practical, practical thing. Thanksgiving. Um, we can see the power of generosity that is generated from within your heart and the impact it can have. For those of you who are in the black during this time, because COVID's an interesting time, for those of you in the black, I'd love for you to take your Omar, your measurement of what you think you need to live this Thanksgiving, and just hold it before God and just say, how much is enough? How much do I actually need? And, and I'd love for you, out of the excess, whatever he says, this is what you need, out of the excess, I ask that you would Give that this Thanksgiving on October 18th as we talk about where this church is going and to places like even Ontario and Red Lake and where God is leading us and calling us. This, there's something you can give so that others can receive. And if you're in the red, it's very simple. If you have a need, just like this lady who called, would you ask so that you could receive? Would you ask that you could receive? She received because she asked. And the, I'd love for you to, to partner with either Christians around you and ask or, or call, call the church and ask because maybe God wants to do something new for you. But I'm relying, if, if you are in the black, then we're going to need that to help people in the red. I also believe God wants to collect, connect the black and the red with your finances. This Thanksgiving, take your Omar, how much is enough to God and if you're in need, please ask. Number two, something supernatural. I would ask that you would ask your God to give you spiritual eyes to see him working in the cultures in your context. 
in Nipawa, in the Filipino community, God is moving powerfully. I mean, you ask God to have eyes to see where he's there so you can grow deeper in unity with your brothers and sisters. Here in Portage, we have a great amount of First Nations communities and culture. Would you ask God for eyes to see where he's already moving in that culture so that maybe there's a piece that is actually missing for you. There is a revelation about God that is deeply embedded in a different culture than yours so that you might get to know this God in a fuller way through someone else speaking their language, moving into your heart. Ask God for that. If you're wondering if God is in culture, I came across this the other day. He's, he's been moving all along. This is really cool. Just kind of a neat connection for me. Here's the Chinese word for righteousness. It's the word for sheep. It's the word for me. And they're overlaid. Now, God was around way before that language. That language was way around way before Christianity. How did that come there? Let's have eyes to see God around us. Number three, supernatural and practical um, soul care. If you're, this is a really practical thing the churches does, and it has supernatural effects that we see. We take things that are holding you back, for unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, uh, generational patterns, all these things that have taken up space where the Holy Spirit should have access to, we go through those things in our life so that the Holy Spirit can fill that with power in your life. And it's in this really practical thing that we see so much supernatural transformation in people's lives. You can sign up for those classes. They start, you can sign up right now. They happen in November. And you can do that through the info booth. You can do that in Dauphin, talking to Kevin and Ipawa, talking to Ryle and Sonia here, talk to Tamara, call the office. Right now we're going to sing. And I just ask that God would powerfully meet you practically and supernaturally in this song right now.
before we go and bless you. May you, adopted and blessed by God, go with the power of the Holy Spirit as agents of justice and mercy. May you pay attention to the forgotten. Feel the hungry with good things and by your words and actions witness to the kingdom of God. May you be steadfast, unmovable, always working enthusiastically for the Lord, because nothing you ever do for Jesus is ever, ever wasted. God bless you as you go today.